Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. The Nation's Station, Manx Radio. Hello and welcome to the latest look back at Talking Heads. This week, a central resident record, the future of the Castle Mona and giving priority to cyclists at left turns were some of the items up for discussion. Here's Stu Peters with more. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Dean design showroom on the island. Could cutting down the length of the horse tram track reduce its appeal? A volunteer group's added its voice into the discussion about the future of the Douglas horse trams. Friends of Douglas Bay Tramway believe the tramway should be fully maintained along its current traditional route, from Derby Castle to the sea terminal. It says the tramway has been in place for over 140 years and should be protected. Could shortening the tram lines damage the appeal of the attraction? Could it put heritage enthusiast groups off visiting the island or would it make little difference in the great scheme of things? Tell us what you think. And uh, on the lines now, we're joined by uh, David Quirk. The major issue on that was, at my time was, that to keep them off the walkway, on the right. promenade walkway itself, it was a ridiculous idea and the minister should have been, and his members should have been really chastised for costing us X amount of money. I don't know whether it's actually three million. I, I heard it was a million, but I, I didn't think three was in the frame. But you see, don't forget they've they've spent all this money buying all this track now that's hidden down near um, down down below you. I think it is down near the old uh, breakwater there. Yeah, but I mean they can use it for the other heritage railways. It doesn't just have to be used for the tram tracks. I think that's still to be proven yet because when you when uh, some people say to me you have to adapt it, and I know, I know a guy that's no longer with us. He died a, a few weeks ago there was in the, uh, the MER for a long, long time, and he said to me, uh, <clears throat> both the, the horse cars themselves and the MER tra- uh, vehicles, they would have to, one would have to be adapted, and they could be, the horse cars ones could be adapted. It's something to do with the wheels or something like that. Oh, I don't but know. Can I just say, I'm disappointed with the, uh, Mr. Harmer actually coming forward. I don't know whether his, full, his team is fully supportive with the Morris officers, are um, wagging his tail to say that um, you know it's going to finish at the Broadway or, or the Sefton there. I think it's a, it would be an absolute nightmare to, to, to finish it there. Can you imagine people getting on and off? That's one of the major junctions. Well, uh, have you ever tried to get to Onken or back into... By the Ville Marina there, I would have thought that would be a perfect place. You've got that huge expanse of walkway where people can wait and stuff. I, I would have thought that would be a perfect place to have the end of the, the line. See that thing. But I'm, I'm with the people who wanted to go the full length, and that was the decision that was made by the last Parliament, whether we liked it or not, whether we won the case or not. It was like when we went to plan and we won the case regarding uh, keep off the walkway. It was... Uh, um, Areas of um, special interest shouldn't be there, should never have been done. The members really should have the one track, and I don't know why it's gone back to two tracks, uh, to tell you the truth, why it wasn't on one track. And as I've said in the past, I'm led to believe by people that know is that there is one of the uh, the electric cars there that has its own DC pack on board with it uh-huh. and can be run in the winter. So we can use the Summerland car park and bring people into town for Christmas. Yes, I'm Everybody not sure. Everybody wins. I don't know. I'm it's not sure. Be a, it'll I, I, be worth listening to next week anyway to see what uh, waffle happens. The thing about the, the horse trams is that I think that they are unique. I accept that. I mean, I think we ought to get rid of them personally. Uh, it's a personal point of view, not shared by many, I appreciate. Um, but I think we ought to get rid of them and move on and get into the 21st century. But yeah. I do appreciate that they've got a, an important part in our heritage and history. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it's that's all it ever is going to be. It's never going to be part of the rail infrastructure, is it? The transport infrastructure. It's just a a novelty. But if we use a stew to to use the electric cars on, which they can do, it's not uh, rocket science, it's fairly easy to do. Mm. All it's a question of doing is adapting the the horse car and believe bogey wheels uh, slightly different and and both of them will run together. Mm. And you could have special occasions, you can have a, a historical day. I remember some years ago when they actually ran the steam train up to Snaefell. And uh, I remember I was only, I was young at the time there thinking to myself, that'll never happen. But it did. Well, yeah, I mean, and the other thing is that people can't afford to use that heritage transport anymore because the gas bills have gone up. Now, that was you, wasn't it? <laughs> no, no. Uh, you, you'll see in the future. <laughs> the, the, the issue is, around the world is, you know, the oil prices are going up now. You look at the price of diesel. You touched on it last week. Mm. And I'd suggest that people don't get rid of diesel vehicles because uh, in the island or in the, the production in the UK now and other places like that, they're putting ethanol in the petrol. 
Now, ethanol doesn't travel over sea very well and can't be mixed, I believe, on the tankers to come here. So there's going to be a dramatic change in the future. So I'd suggest to everybody, don't sell their diesel vehicles. Diesel's not that volatile compared to petrol. Oh, all right. OK, there you go. You heard, heard it from Quirky. Uh, so it must be true. Let's go uh, to line three, and we've got John on. Hello, John. I think I might be able to put a, a slightly different perspective on uh, this issue with the horse tram. Oh, good Um For, for me sins, um, you know, long-term island resident, railway enthusiast, tramway enthusiast, and so on, uh, I'm also the chairman of the, the Branch Line Society, which is a... Uh, a mostly UK-based society with over a thousand members, British Isles and uh, throughout the world. And uh, our society has a particular interest in transport infrastructure. And uh, we, we arrange visits and charters right the way through the, uh, the railway networks that are available to us, including uh, the, the preserved and heritage railway lines in the, the UK and, and indeed on the Isle of Man. You know, we, we had a a party of people from across here on the 23rd of September okay. riding on the horse trams. So uh, uh, while I don't speak for the Branch Line Society because the society doesn't think, get engaged in political argument, from a personal point of view, I've certainly had uh, broad-ranging contacts over the years with the, the various heritage and preserve groups. So uh, I think I've got a reasonable grasp of uh, where things are heading uh, across, so to speak. Yeah. And the, the drift of what's happening to the heritage transport scene across is that the, the established heritage railways are either expanding, they're, they're laying more track where the land is available so that they have a, a longer offering, or they're consolidating what they've got. And uh, uh, the, you know, the Seven Valley Railway at the moment has got a share appeal out for... Uh, two and a half million pounds to uh, to consolidate its infrastructure but isn't that the difference john aren't these things that you're talking about effectively self-funding or or run by volunteers rather than by government uh, a lot of them are but uh, i think if you take the seven valley as the example uh, when the seven valley railway was hit by the floods three or four years ago and had to close the local authorities had to felt that they were obliged to step in to support the Seven Valley Railway in its reconstruction because they recognised that the contribution that the preserved railways make to the local economy is so astronomical that they could not afford to have that work delayed. Okay. Now, we have a slightly different position on the Isle of Man. The, uh, the heritage transport offering is primarily in the hands of government. Mm. And, and that has worked very, very well for a number of years. The crucial decision that Tinwell took on the 20th of July was that the, the horse trams should become part of that national transport heritage offering. Now, that, that opened up all sorts of doors. And in particular, I think it was recognised by Tinwald on the 20th of July that there was going to be a period of transition. Yes. Douglas Corporation had, let's, let's be honest, not been very enterprising in marketing the horse trams. Yeah. What we've seen in the last summer is that the railways have been quite enterprising. Uh, they've, they've dipped their toes in the water and they've... Uh, uh, they've come up with some quite whizzy ideas that have actually gone down very, very well with the, the enthusiasts. That appears to be the case, certainly, yeah. So, uh, you know, going back to our own visit on the, the 20th of September, um, we, we didn't get a huge number over because it was a one-day event and people basically had to come here for the day. But they paid for aeroplane tickets, they paid for boat tickets, and they paid for hotel beds. And they had a thoroughly enjoyable day out on the... Uh, the horse trams. Now, the problem, um, as I see it, is that by trying to reinvent the wheel and go over the old ground, Ray Harmer is, in fact, uh, again, undermining the, the support of the enthusiasts, which basically the railways have been rebuilding over the summer. Okay. The horse trams are an important part of our heritage transport offering. And uh, really, um, the threat to 
actually curtail the, the horse tram tracks. Now that the horse trams are under the auspices of government, uh, has actually raised quite serious concerns that a number of my members have, have voiced. If, if the horse trams under the auspices of Isle of Man government can have their route mileage cut back, then... Um, you know some of the uh, the arguments which might be uh, quite seductive to to some could be applied equally to the steam railway um to the MER to Snaefell um if uh, if you say that well the bulk of the people travelling on the horse tramway uh, at, make their bookings at Derby Castle therefore you can justify closing the uh, the C terminal end of the line because yeah. the majority of people don't book from there. That argument applies to the steam railway. Okay. Uh, they, they they could come along with a proposal to cut it back at Castletown and forget the uh, the Castletown to Port Erin bit. Uh, same argument could apply to closing the MER north of Laxey. All right. If you look, if you look at the Snaefell Mountain Railway, how many tickets actually originate at Snaefell Summit? There's no financial justification for keeping Snaefell Summit open. Okay. On tickets sold, but that's the destination that most people go to. Yeah. And on our horse tramway, uh, the bulk of people, and certainly the bulk of enthusiasts and tourists, want to travel the full length. All right. You're clearly very passionate about it, very knowledgeable about it. So thank you very much for your call. I think you've raised some interesting points there. Let's have a word with Tommy now. Hello, Tommy. I'm just saying that uh, Quirk is exactly right in, in the comments he makes, uh, Stuart. Uh, about what? Uh, hoverboards? About, about where the uh, the tram should be situated. OK. It should be just one track, as I said before, in, in the centre of the promenade. Yeah. Um, um, it, it's it's, it's uh, paramount that we keep them, Stuart. Um, I mean, I mean you're, you're up with idea about getting rid of them. <laughs> uh, uh, look, let's get rid of everything, Stu. Let's get rid of the uh, electric trams. <laughs> they don't do much business. Let's get rid of the steam railway. They, they probably don't pay for themselves. I mean, if we do that, we're going back to, to the 1850s then, Stu. Uh, <laughs> where, uh, uh, let's get rid of all the cars so we're, we're all marooned where we are. Ramsey people <laughs> never get into Douglas. You, you've got, yeah, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, Stuart. <laughs> All right, Tommy. <laughs> Okie doke. Uh, well, I think we know where you stand on that one. Well, thank you very much for your call. Let's have a look at some more comments by text or whatever. And about horse trams. The constant reference to heritage is starting to show the Isle of Man as an old and decaying entity. Well, that's a point of view. Uh, Margaret says, uh, do leave things as they are. You're ripping the island apart. Simon says, it's a unique system and popular, but shame the Council of Ministers prefer car parking spaces to make extra cash. Do they? Is that what this is about, do you think? Um, what is 187000 in the total cost of the prom? The government has wasted that and more on non-start schemes. Well, yes, but I've mentioned this before. I mean, that's what we employ them for, is to look at things. And if they didn't investigate alternatives, then we'd all be complaining about the fact that, you know, they had a great opportunity to do something different and they didn't have the foresight to even look at it. So... Um, I think they damned whatever they do as far as things like that are concerned. Keep the trams as they are, repair the road. Does everything have to be sacrificed to the great god of speed? A few minutes extra on your journey while you may be caught behind a tram. So what, says Jeff? I don't know that that's the, the concern of people. I don't think it's the speed uh, thing that's uh, a real concern. Uh, the idea of starting the horse trams in the middle of the prom is a big mistake. It'll make no money as the distance travelled is too short. People are not going to walk halfway up the promenade to get a horse tram to travel a short distance to the end of the prom. People getting off the boat often get the horse tram to their hotels, do they? Many visitors may not even know that they're there. Uh, there are YouTube videos where people who visited the Isle of Man were saddened when they learned last year that they were maybe being discontinued. It seems to me that somebody doesn't want, want the horse trams. And that from our friend Michael. OK, Stu, next week's debate should be, uh, shouldn't be should be about shortening the tram tracks. The debate should be about Mr Harmer and the DOI's contempt and total lack of respect for Timwell Court. If David Quirk, former MHK, doesn't know if it was three million or one million, what hope is there for the rest of us, says Albert. Uh, OK, yeah, I feel that the lock prom should continue to have a track so the service can continue while the rest of the prom is repaired. Uh, Jeffrey Boot made a comment during the Timwell debate on 20th July that says it all, and I quote from Hansard, this is a developing destination for cruisers and it would seem absolutely counterproductive to cut the trams off from a potential source of revenue. I think if we do cut the track short, it'll fail to offer any form of heritage transport link 
and in essence it'll set the trams up for failure. It's a bit like the tracks on the mountain railway starting at Laxey and finishing at the base of Snaefell and telling people they need to walk to the summit. Uh, that um, sent to us by Jenny, thank you. Uh, if it only costs 20000 to do the main prom, why not extend it to lock prom for another twenty grand and even three or five years to do it again? Leave horse trams as is, saving a lot of money. It makes sense, surely. That from Johnny. Stu, I fully agree with the tram continuing the full length of the prom. What's more concerning is that Minister Harmer has done a complete U-turn on this issue after a long protracted debate in Timwald, including Mr Harmer's supportive contribution, culminating the current status quota and the full length. Just who is setting policy on this island? That from Neil. The Nation Station, Blanks Radio. Would a single register of personal data help to simplify dealings with government? The collection of information on residents by governments has often proved a sensitive area. The need to protect details details held on databases for security and privacy reasons is paramount. At present, information on Manx citizens is held in around 60 main databases, more than 200 separate systems across government. Some critics say the less information kept on us, the better. The idea of the creation of a single resident record is going to be floated in Timwell this month when Policy and Reform Minister Chris Thomas calls for a feasibility study. What do we think about this? Could a single record for each person help to streamline dealings with government? Or does the idea worry you? Do you worry about Big Brother? A couple of texts in already. (laughs) David H, ever the cynic. I'm sure that Mr Hitler would have found a centralised database most useful on his tour of Europe, says David. Um, Yeah. Uh, Regarding the single database, I would assume that with government not being a single legal entity, express permission would have to be given to each individual department by oneself and that information not to be shared with non-permitted parties or departments. Good point, yes, a technical question. Um, And uh, looking at it, I don't know the answer, but I would suspect that you're probably right. Uh, Mike called, it's probably a great idea as long as other departments don't have access to your medical records. Uh, So they'd have to have some sort of secret code to access things like that. As long as those over and above who need to know can't see the relevant bits of information, I think it's a great idea. But I would sound one note of caution. If it's all in one database, a hacker would only have to hack into one system to access everything, but he might get a bit fed up hacking into the current 200. Uh, yes, OK. Uh, Albert's being on. He says, apologies for a not-too-short email. No, as long as the points are valid, that's all right. This database thing's been a dream of former Minister Chris Robertshaw from the days he ran the Sefton. Amongst other things, he wanted to effectively exclude people who were banned from the bar. His idea was that everyone would have to get and access to the hotel and pay for the drinks only with a special card. There were a lot of benefits, he said, and in his own hotel, I suppose he could do whatever he wanted. However, he managed to eventually become an MHK, and then a minister, and so his pipe dream was starting to become a more extensive reality. Mr Robert Shaw left Comin for whatever reason and managed to scrape his word back into the House of Keys at the last election. Clearly, he's mentioned he's mentored Chris Thomas, who is his ministerial replacement. Chris Thomas is an amenable chap, but I feel he shouldn't be persuaded by somebody's by some the sometimes bizarre ideas of his predecessor. Stand back, Mr Thomas, you're too valuable to be labelled a crank politician, says Albert. Oh, he'll be labelled all sorts by the time he's finished. No two ways about that. Um, I don't mind this sort of thing. I know that people get very nervous about any idea of databases, but, I mean, there are dozens of them already. And uh, I think that the idea of just having one makes much more sense, personally. And I think that the gov.im online services website is quite good in that respect. I know that I moved house in April, and um, uh, because I do online tax and stuff, uh, there is a facility where you can put your change of address details onto the gov.im website, uh, and they tell all the people that that you know are a part of that sort of thing. Um, I don't think it works for everything, but I think it works for you know tax and national insurance and uh, was it health? Did health? No, I think maybe the health department was part of it or whatever. Um, I don't think it worked for everywhere or everybody that uh, I'm in contact with, but it worked for a good few, and it does save an awful lot of faffing about. Uh, Joe Cod, in the recent census forms sent out to gather information about 16-year-olds, they put the wrong email address at the end for people to respond to. Ah, uh, schoolboy error. Uh, they put an extra dot at the end, so if people don't get the address right, they won't be able to return it. Right, OK. Um, well, yeah, human error. <laughs> <laughs> that means that something's authentic if it goes horribly wrong. You know, when we get to the situation, I was watching Westworld last night, um, and humans, I think, the night before on the TV about robots and stuff. You know, when everything is perfect all the time, then we'll know that the robots have taken over, I suppose. Let's go to the lines and talk to Ken. Hello, Ken. It's not a bad idea in general, but how do you get on it? Do you get it when you're born, unless you're a visitor when you're registered for birth? 
uh, if you're a visitor, you wouldn't, you know, perhaps there'd be... Uh, no, I think it'd only be for Manx residents, wouldn't it? It'd only be oh, for yeah, either man residents. The easiest way to do it is when if you're a Manx resident and you're born. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, yeah. so the births are into it. Would you stay on it when you die as a historical record? Um, I Manx? don't know. I suppose there'd be a tick box, you know, yeah. deceased. Well, it'd be like being in the jury service. Now, the other thing, would, would the Cabinet Office be able to talk whoever does the census? Would, have they ever followed through with their thing that they were going to prosecute people who didn't fill in the electoral roll to avoid jury service? Uh, Have you prosecuted anybody that hasn't filled in the census form? Well, I think that was an idea. I don't think they actually brought it in, did they? Well, well, they did, they did for the uh, electoral roll, because there's all threatening letters knocking about. Oh, OK. And, you know, yes, they were going to do it to get people, because people weren't filling the electoral roll because they wanted to avoid jury service. Would big, now, the big brother thing is, would the tax man be able to... I don't know when you get your tax form. Is that when you first uh, start work, where they'd be able to send somebody a tax form when you reach a, the age, although you, as a child you could be paying tax? Mm. Could the police track you down using the database? Well... Like, like yeah. you wrongly? W- w- would that be a bad thing, necessarily? Well, no, that's not, but it depends who's got access to it. Would the tax man be able to track you down? Well, yeah, but would that be a bad thing, necessarily? Well, possibly, possibly not, if, you, if you're a... But it depends what the purpose is, though. Uh, you know, I mean, you're asking perfectly valid questions, but my view is that um, if it makes it harder for people to, to abuse the systems, makes it harder for people to work for the black economy and not pay any income tax or whatever, then th- those have got to be good things for the rest of us, well, surely. Yeah, there are quite a few people over here who have retired here who aren't on the Manx tax f- system because mm. they didn't realise, I think. Mm. They'd, be, they'd be tracked down, but they might be... You know, we it might be old money because it could get the money back from the UK and just pay us a small, a smaller percentage. But I mean, in principle, what do you think of the idea? In principle, it's a good idea. Depending on what other systems are going to go away. Right. Okay. You know, will, will it really replace the other, you know, thirty systems they're talking about? Well, that's the idea of it. You know, it's supposed to make the whole thing more efficient and cheaper. So. Or would they have to have that system, but have add-ons? For, you know, various other information that other people aren't entitled to. Don't know. Don't know. Okay. All right, Kay, thanks very much for your call. Uh, now then, you little romper-stomper, Charlie Kay. <laughs> Hello, Frank. With such genius ideas, you'll be headhunted by old Donny Trump at this rate. Facts, says Frank. Well, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> As long as I made a million quid out of the job, I don't care who I work for. On the other hand, the government will find no shortage of people willing to sift through other people's business all day, says Albert. Well, yeah, but I mean, I think all that we're talking about is is your name and address and, and phone number and email address. I mean, I think it's just your basic contact details to start off with. Um, I don't think people will be able to go through your medical records at the tax office, for example. I don't think that's the idea at all. Uh, but, yes, um, you know, people sometimes say, oh, well, the Aliman, you know, everybody reckons that the Aliman's different to everywhere else, and it's not, it's just the same. It is different because we are a small community and, and everybody knows somebody else. <laughs> it really is true, that, isn't it? You can talk to somebody and you find that you've got mutual friends or, you know, you know the family of somebody or whatever. Um, so, yeah, there is that worry about uh, whether or not your information is secure. But similarly, you know, we've got to accept the fact that it might always happen i might go to the doctors and you know it might be that somebody that i vaguely know or somebody that knows somebody that i know is working behind the counter at the doctors and they've got access to my medical records that's just the way of life i suppose all people connected to the internet today should pay for a vpn service a virtual private network that isn't it i'm not quite sure how they work vpns hide your location and encrypt any data traveling from your computer to the vpn and out onto the internet even your internet provider can't decrypt the data total privacy okay um it's maybe something that i ought to look at but you know like i say i work on the basis that when i'm on the computer anybody can see what i'm doing if they wanted to uh, so <laughs> uh, the idea is not to do anything wrong i suppose um but uh, uh, yeah, everybody seems to be very worried about encrypting data and all the rest of it. Basic stuff like your name and address and your date of birth and stuff. Do you really need to encrypt that data and keep it safe? Also, some internet services not available due to the network addressing method a local internet service provider has in place. VPNs bypass this error and allow full access to services like buying apps on Android phones. 
Okay, I'll bow to your supreme knowledge on that. Uh, why doesn't Mr. Thomas microchip everyone? He'll know who we are and what we're doing instantly, says Cliffy. Uh, I'm sure that those in control of the system would be able to lose their own derogatory information, says David H. <laughs> Uh, Charles says, Dear Stu, I think this is a no-brainer. I think it's great, but I trust each department would, wouldn't be permitted to hold any information that wasn't uh, um, that they weren't entitled to. Uh, good. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Should the government take steps to put the Castle Mona Hotel into public ownership? Seems there are developers who may be interested in acquiring the historic building, which is currently owned by the Sefton Hotel Group. In the House of Keys yesterday, Defa Minister Geoffrey Boot was asked whether a close enough watch was being kept on its condition. Yes, was the answer, although Mr Boot has himself yet to tour inside. Although a survey, a survey carried out by an off-island company, the Morton Partnership, on behalf of the Manx government, described its condition as quite fair. Who should have ownership of the Castle Mona building? Would you like to see it put into public hands or should that be avoided at all costs? Tell us your thoughts on this. And uh, a gentleman's just called me who seems to know more about it than I do. Refira, let's go to the lines. I'm actually looking at it right now. I'm right by it. That's probably why the reception's so bad. Um, (laughs) So, um, yeah, we're we're actually part of a a consortium that is is interested in taking the Castle Mona on. Um, our founder is uh, actually conducting a PhD um, study with Reading University on the castle, oh, right. so on the architectural history, but also the adaptive reuse of its future. Um, uh, his background is, uh, is he's an expert in architectural uh, in architecture, but also green building technology. Um, and we kind of want to make that, that castle an institute um, of excellence, of new building standards, academic advancements, uh, industrial innovation, but also cultural diplomacy. Um, the island doesn't have a building that it can call its own, uh, that can really represent what the Isle of Man is. And with the recent Man and Biosphere jurisdiction, yeah. we believe the Isle of Man has a real opportunity to create um, uh, a new brand for itself, uh, using its past, but also its future. And that castle has an opportunity to do that. It's a brand building um, and, you know, we've been looking at it for two years now. And actually, we did make an offer a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we'll probably be, you know, l- looking about how to... Uh, so are you the developer that the minister's been talking about or is there somebody not. else? No, we're not. And so we, we will write to the minister today because actually there's a commercial negotiation going on. And I, I probably wouldn't have phoned in today um, had the minister not made the comments yesterday. Right. Um, we are interested. We're the only party as, as, of, as of last the agent confirmed uh, the again, walk yeah. nearer a window because you're breaking up. It sounds like I'm talking to Norman Collier at the moment. So I am. So, it, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's not your fault, clearly. But it's the technology. So, I mean, you, you used an awful lot of buzz phrases there in, in your introduction, but what would you actually see the building used as? It, I'm presuming not as a hotel if you were to buy it. No, so it will actually be a private residence with a members club. Um, but this is uh, a members club that the whole island would be able to use. So we want to create a space for social interaction, um, but also that it would be a, an institute that, that uses very advanced processes of building techniques. So we're able to actually um, create electricity and energy from rainwater. We're able to power the building um, through people walking through it using technology, which is very advanced. We're also able to um, realise a different aspect of the building's um, future through some of the methods of renovation. Okay. There are two registered features of that building, uh, one being the ceiling, the 212-year-old saloon ceiling, hand-painted, and the other one being the masonry. Mm. Unfortunately, both have been compromised. Um, well, uh, and I mean, the, the, the core of the building is historical, mm-hmm. isn't it? But there have been various addenda over the years, which probably less That's so. Right. So what would you That's do? Right. Would you demolish them and then concentrate on the core building? Our, well, I mean, ultimately, it's an academic study. So it's the process. Our instincts are that those, those, the 60s part would have to come down because it compromises the very fabric of the internal building. And mm. we believe that the, the, uh, the damage is coming from the, the, the poor workmanship of 60s building. I mean, it's, un, it's unfortunate, but it's everywhere. Yeah. So we would see that being rebuilt, keep the core building, but also refer back to George Stewart's original plans. You know, he had some great ideas for that castle, and a lot of things were compromised. 
And so it's about looking at the old plans and letting the academic study um, and academic advancement, the latest in industrial techniques, bringing universities on board, you know, bringing students here from around the world to actually contribute to that building, make it a project, you know, the story of the renovation, a project itself. Um, so so you know, just yeah. just to, to be clear about this, the phone was breaking yeah. up when I asked you earlier on. Did, did, no, no. Did you say that, that your group had put in a, a bid to, to buy yeah. the place or...? We have put in a bid, yes. And, and has, um, has, that, I assume, is with the, the Sefton Group who own it. It is, yeah. And it's, um, and whilst it was a favourable bid, the, the you know the terms of... Uh, the, I don't want to talk too much because I, I feel kind of I'm, I'm speaking outside my remit already. Okay, I'm right. happy to say that we made a bid. Um, we, because of the comments of the minister today, we do need to write to government and understand because it, uh, it you know, it's unusual to speak publicly when commercial negotiations are going on, and uh, uh, those comments are impacting us. All I right. have to say, okay, um, but well. you know, we, I, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable that we've got the right team um, to take the building into the future. Uh, our founders. PhD supervisor is actually Professor Kate Williams, who is the expert on restoration homes um, and royal affairs. She's regularly on TV. Um, uh, our founder also spoke to the uh, the head of the British Conservation um, Organization as well. There's huge academic interest in this castle. We believe that it, it its use in the future really needs to be thought about, and it has to involve the Isle of Man. We would like to see a process where it can be given to the public, but unfortunately the legislation really isn't in place. Currently, Manx National Heritage Law refers to, defers to English National Heritage. The, um, there is no Manx law for Manx Heritage, which is very unusual, and we believe the Castle Mona's renovation will actually be a, um, a project that will enable the Isle of Man to set new standards in heritage for their own site. OK, good stuff. Well, thank you very much for calling today and uh, and hopefully you'll be able to talk to our uh, our news people uh, and we'll be able to uh, to follow this up. But, uh, Rafira, thank you very much indeed for calling. But let's go to the lines because we've got Jeff on who'd like to talk about this. Hello, Jeff. Just briefly, my wife's had the inspiration of why not make it the home for the governor of the Isle of Man, going back to the heritage where it used to be centuries ago, and uh, clean it up by all means, but uh, I think the governor could then uh, have a look out on the prom and be uh, perhaps accessible and uh, so on and so forth, and his biggest stake he's got at the moment in Government House could be used for other, perhaps more uh, immediate purposes. Okay, well, that's a thought, I suppose, yeah. All right, Jeff. thank you. Uh, some comments. Even though the state of the castle owners are disgraced, this is from Alan, to take it into government ownership when they don't have enough money to maintain the property that they own now properly would be a mistake. We can't justify um, magically produced money out of thin air. Right. Uh, send the bulldozers in. I think it's an awful spooky building, says D. <laughs> I don't think it's a spooky building. Uh, hey, boy, this stinks of yes, another government Sefton Group done deal. What's the odds on another set of apartments by the government's favoured developers? I just hope that within my lifetime we actually get an honest and truthful government, says Frank. <clears throat> OK. Yeah, I get the feeling from this conversation with Geoffrey Boot that he's got no real interest in history or heritage or old buildings. They think some people, if you scratch the surface, would be happy for the island to look like... Dub? What? Uh, Dublin? Uh, Dubai? Oh, Dubai! Uh, that from, from Anne. Uh, strange text. It's not just the Castle Mona that's a disgrace. The Royal Port Heron and Castletown Golf Links, yes, I agree, uh, are as bad, but not in Douglas so are ignored. There should be penalties for leaving buildings in such a state, says Tom. I agree with you, Tom. Stu, I wrote this email as that chap was speaking very eloquently about the Castle Mona. He spoke a lot of sense. Good man. But anyway, the Castle Mona surely has to be properly preserved and there needs to be a proper survey carried out. But buildings are funny things and so I suppose are surveyors. If an owner wants to keep a building, then they pay a surveyor to provide a report to preserve of it. If an owner wants to knock a building down and clear the site, then they pay a surveyor to give a report to demolish it. <laughs> yes, I think that's how it works, isn't it? If all else fails, there's always a scrot or two who'll put a match to it. Regards from Albert. <laughs> Sorry, perhaps my most cynical ebb just now. <laughs> OK, thank you, Albert. I'd like to see the Castle Mona as part of Manx National Heritage, says Peter. Uh, show artwork, etc. That's currently in storage with no space to display it. Better place for resident artists than the market. 
give tourists and locals something to visit in what is a fairly dead stretch of the prom. Nearly all flats these days, says Peter. Yeah, I, I think I'm with Dave. I think it, it, it'd be much better to reinstate it as a, a real good quality hotel. You know, we're told that we need more hotel spaces. Whether or not there's enough business to keep it going year-round, I don't know, but... I always thought it was uh, it was great as a hotel. If the building has two features that are listed, how are they allowed to be compromised? I really hope the building can be saved, though, says somebody else. Stu, uh, as a fibrous plasterer, all good and expert, a fibrous plasterer specialising in ornate plaster work, I wouldn't be at all surprised if a ceiling or more than one have fallen down, unless the heating's remained on, which I doubt. Um, the building will be susceptible to damp. These old lath and plaster ceilings will absorb damp and the weight of this, along with the age of the ceilings, will cause them to fall. The average age of a lath and plaster ceiling is 100 to 120 years. It'll be a shame, but I think that the damp will leave well and true, will have well and truly set in now and a lot of damage and rot will have occurred. And that's from Ian from Classic Mouldings. Thanks for getting in touch, Ian. Interesting, I never thought about that, but I suppose you're right. If that, uh, if you allow the damp into old plaster, because it'll just soak up, uh, soak the damp up, won't it? Unless you've got heat on. Get the castle moaner into an entertainment complex to replace some land. Uh, where is entertainment for young families? Some land was brilliant for that. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Cardine Design showroom on the island. You're listening to the latest Talking Heads podcast, featuring highlights from the program over the past week. The Nation Station. Radio. Should cyclists be given priority over vehicles at left turns? Campaigners across the water are pushing for a change to the highway code to make junctions safer for cyclists. British Cycling wants vehicles turning left to always give way to bikes on the road. It started a petition calling for a universal rule to make it simpler, as there are 14 different rules in place for junctions alone. The Manx Highway Code has various references to turning left aimed at different road users. But should cyclists and pedestrians be given priority over vehicles approaching and at junctions? Could a universal rule make things simpler for all, or do the current rules work well as they are? Tell us your thoughts. Is this another area where maybe uh, some enforcement is what we need. The rules and regulations are quite clear. Let's see some enforcement. If people are breaking the rules, let's do them for it. Uh, big fines, and that might make people concentrate a little bit harder. What do you think? Get in touch and tell me. 66 13 68. Let's have a chat about it. 16 If you'd rather send a text, email us to talk at manxradio.com or send us a, a tweet or a message via Facebook. And Fenella's on the line. Well, it's, it was last year this happened. It was dusk and this this bicycle, yeah. and we were stopped at the lights at um, School Hill there, and I was turning up Maloo Road. Right. And this bicycle came, uh, just as the lights were turning, it, they were actually on green, and yeah. I, I was moving. And all I saw was this movement go past, just caught outside of me. It just went... And it was this lad on a cycle. Yeah. He was in black... <laughs> He had the lights were low down. I, I don't know. I think he may have had those lights that um, flash on and off. Yeah, when you're cycling. Yes. Uh, so, but he just went whizzing past, and I didn't. And I just spotted him on the last second because he wasn't there. Yeah. There was nobody there at the side of me because I looked. Stealth you know, cycling. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, and and I I thought if I'd have hit, I stopped. And fortunately, the people behind. The cars behind must have seen him as well because yes. they stopped and let him go. And then I went past and Rob has gone absolutely mad. He said, <laughs> just stop, I'm going to tell him off. <laughs> I bet he didn't <laughs> use those words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, as we drove up the road, we met a police van stand Ooh. at Maloo Church. Yes. It, obviously there to stop people going whizzing around that corner that you're not supposed to drive a bus 30 on. Right. So Rob said, pull up, I'm going to have a word on him. So he went and he told him, and he said, it's all right. He said, we'll have a word on him when he comes past. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> We'd passed him by then. He was he'd obviously coming up the road. Yeah. I mean, he, they don't have a bell. They don't have anything nowadays. And generally speaking, I'm careful of cyclists yes. because I used to cycle my bicycle when I was younger. Yeah, yeah. But... I just thought, it's all very well saying, um, but you see, if, if, you, if you're in a wagon, say, for instance, you don't see them, do they? And, no. and they just, it's up to the cyclist to be aware 
of what's in their way. Well, absolutely. If, if they're undertaking a bus or a wagon uh, that's going to turn left and the, and the wagon or the bus turns into them, whose fault is it? It's actually usually the, the wagon or the bus driver, isn't it? It always is, but they, yeah. if you're in a, something that's high... Yeah. I mean, I wasn't, but um, he just whizzed through on the... On the very last second before it, I turned. It's like an awful lot of things, Fenella. There are lots and lots of responsible cyclists. I've got friends who are very keen cyclists. Oh, yes, most of very them responsible. Are. But there are a few bad eggs out there because yeah, whenever we talk about cyclists. Young, you know, but yeah, yeah. Day. Oh, well, I've seen them riding the wrong way up Athol Street, uh, both on and off the pavement, uh, turning down uh, no entry uh, roads and things like that. Uh, absolutely yeah. disregard for the, the law. Yeah. Um, the youngsters, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. But oh, I haven't it, quite grown up yet. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not good enough, is it? No, younger children are always very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's when they get to teenage years. Yeah. All right, lovely. Thanks for calling, Fenella. Nice to talk to you. Let's go to uh, line three and see what Howard makes of this. Hello, Howard. It's a strange a coincidence. Uh, they're on about cycling and uh, they want preferential treatment, but. Yeah. Uh, either yesterday or the day before, I can't remember exactly, but I was just coming round off the quayside, and a cyclist, a grown man, in full cycling gear, held and everything, nothing wrong with that, yeah. proper proper bike, came off the roundabout coming from the sea terminal. Yes. Oblivious of any traffic, just straight through the middle of everything, and then continued cycling up past the bus shelters at Lord Street. Yeah. With uh, I was following behind him by then, and uh, he just took his hands off the bars and cycled up the road, uh, adjusting his uh, facial uh, masks and hats and everything else, uh, and got up as far as the pedestrian, the uh, the crossing at the uh, the library as it is now. Yes. Straight through there on red. Yeah. And because the traffic is now diverted up Ridgeway Street, he promptly turned up Ridgeway Street, still cycling, uh, not a care in the world, down Victoria Street, and the lights at Starbucks were on red as well, and went straight through them with people trying to cross. Yeah. And down, I thought, well, you're going down. I was going out of the prom to go and park. And um, I thought, where are you going to go now? And he just kept in the middle of the road and then hammered left and went along the prom. Yeah. Completely oblivious of anybody else of any other road. Completely roads. uncaring, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, and poor, isn't these it? These are the ones, the one in 100 or one of thousand that does get the majority of cyclists a bad name because yeah. uh, the majority of them are pretty good. Yeah. But uh, this idiot... As I say, completely uh, oblivious or in such a way that he just didn't give a damn about anything on the traffic. It's me on the road and I'm the important one. Absolutely. If only would they, if only tasers were legal, you know, that would solve that sort of a problem, wouldn't it? Yeah, a rocket grenade launcher or something like that. <laughs> you see, you've gone extreme on the job now. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're going to do it, do it properly. I was looking at non-lethal methods. <laughs> All right, Howard, thank you very much. Uh, good, if you've got a point of view about cyclists, and uh, hopefully not the usual one, which is, yeah, when they would pay road tax, then they can have their own rights and things. Let's go to the lines. We've got Mark on, who's a cyclist, I think. Hello, Mark. I'm... Uh... <laughs> Apologise for invading your program. No, I, no, I no, no, that's what it's here no, for. No, well, I wouldn't normally interfere, but I am a, a car driver. I've driven for uh, since I was twenty-one, um, forty years, sort of thing. Mm. Uh, I've done, done various vehicles, and I also regularly use a bicycle. Yeah. Um, so I've got a first perspective of what the roads are for, for cyclists like, and I've got a fair understanding of how things go wrong. Okay. After I've been uh, ambulanced into a, a resource unit because a car driver opened the door on me. Oh, yes. right. Now, you might uh, understand that the cyclist is obliged to give fair measure of clearance from a parked vehicle yes do you know what that clearance should be one and a half meters i think okay so we're on the road say a single track road or maybe a narrow two track road does that put the cyclist on the other side of the road uh, on the other side of the road so there's a there's a, what might be called a reasonable adjustment in law absolutely yeah. which obliges then the, the car driver to be extra vigilant, perhaps, uh, when he's opening his door. 
um, you know, to make any reasonable and simple steps to observe that cyclist. You well, know, if it's a single track road, in fairness, he might not have expected somebody to come up cycling past him if it's a quiet road. But no, indeed, I, I take but, your point. Right. So um, a, a similar situation occurs when a single cyclist is on a, a public highway that is perhaps not wide enough for two lanes of car traffic mm. and a bicycle to pass freely. And the highway code gives a particular recommendation for groups of cyclists in that situation. Yeah. Do you know what that is? Uh, I know that riding two abreast isn't frowned upon uh, because I it think... It is that, encouraged. Yeah, I think that they say that what you should do is that you should treat a, a cyclist or a couple of cyclists as though it was a car and, and give them that amount of space because it's, uh, it's safer and than having single-file traffic. And specifically from a safety point of view for the cyclist, yeah. the cyclists are encouraged to ride two abreast because yes. it then obliges the car driver to use overtaking manoeuvres appropriate to his skill and the road conditions. Sure. And this is one of the areas where cyclists are intimidated and uh, feel obliged to keep into the curve, which is contrary to safety for pedestrians, etc., etc., and himself, of course. The, the no. problem with what you're saying is, and I, I take on board exactly what you're talking about, Mark, and, and, and I agree, and, and everything that you've said is quite correct, but a lot of these things are down to interpretation and goodwill, aren't they? And it strikes me that there's not an awful lot of goodwill sometimes from either side, from the cyclist or from the motorist. And, and this is the general point that I, I wanted to call about today, is that your radio, radio programme does have some responsibility in steering cultural norms, if I can put it that way, without mm. ridiculing one sector or instance of poor driving, cycling or whatever, but actually highlighting the real issue of uh, safety of any child, uh, young adult, lycra or otherwise, black clothes or otherwise, helmeted or otherwise, on a public highway, which is the uh, freedom uh, that, you know, is an, an inalienable right. All right. Well, uh, just to answer that one, Mark, I mean, what we do is that we actually bring uh, stories to people's attention, which is what we did today. So uh, we, we had that long interview uh, with Sky Television about cycling and about changes possibly to the highway code. And then we ask our listeners to comment on that. Now, I can't control uh, necessarily, and I don't want to control what people say. So if I get 10 texts from people who say that all cyclists are idiots, then I tend to read them out in the hope that we'll get another 10 then that say that all car drivers are idiots. And, and I try and, and moderate to an extent, but I don't want to censor people. Well, I, I believe that you have a responsibility to set the arena where the dialogue is not polarised. Well, that, we've done that. that well, I, I would... I would suggest that um, your, very, your normally very um, fair comments have been slightly polarised today. And I, I, I was actually incensed a few minutes ago because I felt that the real safety issues were being... Um, run into the curb if i can use that euphemism all right well i mean i've got an awful lot more comments here which i'll go through and i don't know which way they're going to go and i expect no, that no, some indeed. of them will say that the, that uh, yeah. cyclists are idiots and others will say that motorists are idiots there are idiots in every class of society including myself i have my moments <laughs> you good man all right at least we can recognize it in ourselves can't we thank you very much for calling mark nice to talk to you the nation station should airlines have a right to overbook flights? There was outcry earlier this week if, after it was revealed that a passenger on a British Airways flight from the Isle of Man was told that she couldn't board because somebody else had been allocated her seat. Madeleine Simpson from Bride, who'd booked the £300 journey with British Airways more than a month in advance to make an urgent appointment, was turned away by the airline at Ronalds Way Airport. What do you think about it? I think it's disgraceful, to be honest. It shouldn't be allowed. It should be outlawed immediately. Uh, but do you think that the practice of overbooking should be allowed? Is it reasonable for airlines to assume that some passengers won't turn up for flights? Or is a standby list a better option? Tell us your thoughts on this. I mean, to me, if you've got, a, as James said, if you've got a 40, if you've got a 50-seater plane, 
saying you've sold all 50 tickets it means that you're full and you've taken the money for all 50 uh, seats it's not like a bus that people pay when they get on it surely um so uh, by overbooking it's not a case of the replacing seats that they've not been paid for the seats have already been paid for and the other thing is i've uh, i mean i don't know the answer to this i expect there's probably a fairly good answer but i don't know what it is so maybe you can tell me what's the idea of online check-ins I don't get that. I thought that the whole idea of checking in at an airport was to let them know that you were there on the premises, ready to get on the aeroplane when you were called. So how you can do that from home 50 miles away to check in, you're not there, you're not checking in. You might be saying that you've not forgotten that you're flying that day, but that's about all. So how does that work? And, And why would somebody who checks in electronically over the internet from a remote location be given uh, precedence over somebody who's actually physically there at the airport. No, the whole thing uh, doesn't work at all for me. What about you? Get in touch and tell us what you think. 66 13 68, let's have a chat about it. Has it ever happened to you, for example? I'm led to believe that this is a fairly rare occurrence where things go wrong, but has it happened to you, or do you know anybody that it's happened to? Let's go to the lines. We've got Jim on. Hello, Jim. Just to let you know, what they used to do in the States in the 60s and 70s, I'm not sure if they do it. Uh, anymore, but they used to have a cheaper ticket called a standby ticket. Yes, where you had to turn up for the appointment. You got a cheaper ticket, but you you turned up for the appointment as if you booked a seat. But uh, if a person didn't turn up for that flight, you were in a queue to get on the aircraft. Yes. So I don't see why they don't do something like that. No, well, I think from listening to Terry Lydiard, that's what they used to do in the old days of Manx Airlines. So it it seems a much fairer system, doesn't it? It is, yeah, because I've been bumped from a flight before, and it's... It messed me up. I had to wait 36 hours for the next one. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so it's... Yeah. It's a bit ridiculous, but... Well, it is. It's a way around it. Especially on the basis that the seats have all, I presume, been paid for, so it's not even as though the airline is trying to make up for for a no-show that it's going to cost them money. It's not. If somebody doesn't show up and they've already bought the ticket, then the airline gets that money anyway, so... Um, yeah. yeah. All right, Jim. Good. Thank you very much for calling us today. Nice to hear from you. And uh, text. Hi, Stu. This happened to my friend last October. He was flying to Belfast with one of the airlines. Because they overbooked, they asked for volunteers to take the flight the next day. They said they'd pay him X amount of money for doing this. He was retired, so he was in no rush, put himself forward. They paid for a taxi back to Douglas. To this date, they've not paid him the promised money. When he inquired about it, he was told he would have to prove that this happened. Of course, he flew home the next day. But as far as I'm concerned, they made a promise to a pensioner and lied. Okay, strong words. And uh, what else have we got? Uh, John called, if they sell a ticket to someone three months in advance for £300, but somebody else books much later and pays £500, will they knock back the one with the cheaper ticket if it's overbooked? It would be interesting to see the statistics on that. That's an interesting concept. I wonder if that happens as well. Yeah. Uh, and from what the lady in Bride said, she'd booked the uh, the ticket in plenty of time. So I wonder if somebody came along and paid more for the ticket. Good thought. Uh, Alan says, utter drivel from BA. It doesn't matter if the person intended to travel doesn't turn up. They've got the money already anyway. They obviously depend on people not turning up so that they can make more money for the seats available. They should be done for selling goods under false pretensions. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, unbelievable that after booking and paying for a flight, you refuse you be refused boarding because of this immoral, although apparently legal practice. Major reason, along with so many others, that air travel today is a nightmare, says Pam. It is too, isn't it? You know, I, I've said before on the programme, I used to really look forward to flying somewhere. Not anymore. It's it's something that I dread now. The whole thing is uh, totally disagreeable. Uh, online check-in, less staff, says Jay. Yeah, I suppose that's what it is. Catherine says it's just a terminology thing, but uh, uh, and that it's all uh, to do with just uh, knowing who's going to be there and all the rest of it and uh, printing off your boarding tickets early. And um, I think it's... No, it doesn't work for me at all, that. The, the, the whole idea of checking in is, is to know that people are actually at the airport ready to go how can you check into a flight at Heathrow if you're in Birmingham you can't anything could happen um, what would have happened if this person had onward travel arrangements it's a foul practice you shouldn't be able to sell things twice end of story you're absolutely right I can't disagree with that uh, for a second you shouldn't be able to sell something twice no matter how we travel 
It's stacked in the favour of the operator, like sheep into a pen, staffed with a face like a slapped... Mm-mm. Yes, uh, dread travel in this day and age. <laughs> well, the staff, I think, try and make the, the best uh, of the job that they can, most of them anyway, um, because, you know, they, they don't make the rules. They're just there to uh, to administer them. Stu, if you book a flight and the airline take your money, surely they should guarantee you a seat. Yes, of course they should. This is another case. The world's gone mad. It's so laughable. You'd think it was the Isle of Man government it was Isle of Man government run, says Ian. <laughs> well, what a nice, refreshing change that it isn't a, a government story. Um, yes, this is exactly what I was texting about, says Liz. I don't get booking in online either. I thought boarding cards were a way of knowing that you were definitely there for the flight. If, God forbid, there was an accident, they've got a correct record of everybody ready for that flight or on the flight. Yeah. Uh, true. About 10 years ago, my family and I checked in at an airport in Crete returning from a fortnight's holiday. The family four behind us in the queue at the check-in desk weren't able to board because the flight had been overbooked and the next flight back to the UK with that airline was in four days' time. I never knew what happened to them. Well, I presume that they were put up at the uh, at the airline's expense in a nice hotel and all the rest of it, and fed and watered by the... But I don't know. And what about, you know, I mean, I, one presumes that at least one of that uh, four people uh, had a job to get back to. What do you say to your employer if you can't get back? No, it just shouldn't be allowed, and that's the end of it as far as I'm concerned. Catherine is very analytical about these things, and she said, well, yes, but if there was a, a disaster with an airliner, uh, then they'd probably look at the uh, at the stubs that you give, that you hand over before you board the aeroplane. Uh, so, the, you know, uh, the, the boarding card stubs, uh, that's how they'd probably put together a passenger manifest so that they'd know who was on it, uh, rather than the online bookings. But, uh, well, I don't, uh, Stu, I'm with you on this. Uh, I don't get this online check-in thing. Um, we travel November each year to Cyprus with EasyJet and they email you to say check-in is open weeks before we fly. So we end up checking in to fly home from, C- from Cyprus before we've even left the Isle of Man. It seems ridiculous, says Caroline. I mean, it does to me, uh, I have to say. Uh, would she not be entitled to compensation under denied boarding, says Jay? I expect so, but um, from what I understood of the interviews, uh, uh, there was no compensation liable for the, you know, she had some sort of a, a paid appointment that she was going to, and uh, uh, the airline wouldn't accept responsibility for that. Is it called consequential loss? And I think that most T's and C's say, you know, that they'll not be held liable for consequential loss, um, which is wrong. Um, Stu, what does booking online mean? Uh, David, I mean, I, I don't have a, an accent that's that strong that you can't understand it, surely. Um, all right, booking online, if it makes you happier. Most airlines used to offer standby flights were more or less a fixed price, but if you took a chance and arrived on the day, you could get a cheap standby ticket to fill any vacant seats. These days, it's cheaper to book early as possible with high prices near the time of travel. They also offered standby, even though there may be many empty seats, it would undermine the current booking and accountancy system. Online check-in, well, that's a whole different subject. I don't think the airlines and society have quite got a grip on this internet thing yet, says Albert, who was formerly part of the jet set. Uh, right, OK. Uh, if you have an overnight, do would the airline pay the hotel? You can cancel up to 24 hours before. If you have, you know, I'm not sure that I understand that one, I'm afraid. Um, the overbooking of flights is common practice in such places as America. Unfortunately, we're in this position, thanks largely to the likes of former MHK, uh, Tony Brown, and Chief Minister. Mm-hmm. It was Brown who introduced this idiotic open skies policy, where at one time Manx Airlines operated 115-seat aircraft. On the first departure to London Heathrow, by the way, we now have BA City Flyer operating a 48-seat aircraft to London City. I'm sure everyone can do the maths. The Isle of Man government were offered a golden share in Manx. Airlines, a company which, to my knowledge, never engaged in the practice of overbooking and would change a ticket without charge for an earlier flight so long as there were seats available. With a hodgepodge of carriers now serving the island, such as EasyJet, which flies a schedule to suit it rather than us, wants to have every sympathy for the lady concerned. The Isle of Man currently has the air service it deserves. Uh, that from Simon. Strong words. Talking Heads, brought to you by Magic Carpets, with the only Dean design showroom on the island. That's it for the latest look back at Talking Heads. Our thanks as ever to everyone who took part in the programme. If you'd like to get involved in the discussion, you can call, text or email between midday and 2pm on weekdays, or get your thoughts to us via Facebook or Twitter using the hashtag MRTalkingHeads. You can listen back to each day's programme in full using the on-demand section of maxradio.com. And if there's anything you think we should be discussing on the programme, let us know by emailing talk at maxradio.com. But that's it for now, so until next time... 
Goodbye. Don't sit in the slow lane. Join the fast lane right now with Shaw's all new Super Fast Plus broadband. Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds, and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high speed action with Super Fast Plus broadband from Shaw. For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey, and Port Erin or click Shaw.com. Love being Shaw. Terms and conditions apply.